Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, to a royal rendezvous, unveiling the secrets of Windsor. It took me a second there because um, if you're familiar with history through fiction, we often do something called what's new in historical fiction. So this is going to be a little bit different. And we're just focusing on our two authors here today, Bryn Turnbull and Christine Wells. Um, but before I have them introduce themselves, um, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and history through fiction. So my name is Colin Mustful. I'm the founder and editor of History Through Fiction. We're an independent press based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we publish historical fiction. Uh, I'm so glad that all of you could join us for this special Zoom event. Um, please um, say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. Maybe tell us what you're currently reading, uh, anything like that. Um, so the event uh, will be pretty casual. Um, we'll, I'll, we'll have our guests discuss their novels. Um, it'll be about 45 minutes of, of me facilitating discussion with them, and then I will let you, the audience, ask any questions that you might have of the authors, and then we'll wrap things up after about 60 minutes. If you have any technical difficulties, the best advice I can offer is just to leave the meeting and come back in and see if that, that fixes things. Okay, well, without further ado, uh, let's welcome our guests. Uh, Christine, if you could say hello and tell us a little bit about your new novel coming out on the 12th. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks, Colin, for having us. Uh, my name is Christine Wells, and I've got The Royal Windsor Secret coming out next Tuesday, so that's September 12th. And it is uh, about, well, uh, first of all, I'm from Australia, as you might be able to tell from the, the accent. So it's 7 a.m. tomorrow here for all you uh, <laughs> North Americans. Um, yeah, so early start for me today. And uh, The Royal Windsor Secret is about Cleo Davenport, who is a young woman who grows up in this luxurious hotel in Cairo, Egypt. And she comes to believe that she is the illegitimate secret daughter of Edward VIII. So that is the reason that um, we're talking about Royal Windsor secret <laughs> today and the, and the Royal Windsors. Uh, Bryn, would you like to? Yeah, thank you, Christine. Yeah, Bryn, why don't you tell us about yourself and, and your, the novel that you'll be kind of focusing on today uh, as well as some of the, your other work. Yeah, hi. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, nice to see some uh, some familiar names and unfamiliar names popping up on the Zoom meeting, uh, you know, banner across the top. Uh, my name is Bryn Turnbull. I am, like Christine, an author of historical fiction who absolutely adores the uh, Windsor family and loves to write about them. So I've got four, uh, three novels out now. And The Woman Before Wallace was actually my first baby. Uh, it came out in 2020. And so it's lovely to be revisiting this story and these characters alongside Christine. Um, I also wrote, uh, my other novels are The Last Grand Duchess, which is about the um, fall of the Romanov dynasty witnessed through the eyes of Olga, eldest daughter of Nicholas and Alexandra, and The Paris Deception, which came out this past May about art theft and forgery in Nazi-occupied Europe. Wonderful. Thank you, Bryn, and thank you, Christine, for joining me for this today. Um, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, Christine, could you start us off just giving us a little bit of historical context for the British monarchy during the time period that your novel takes place? And specifically, could you talk to us about Edward VIII and the various relationships that sparked the controversies around him? Sure. Thanks, Colin. Um, so my story starts in at the end of World War I when Edward VIII was the Prince of Wales and he was quite young then. And he, he, the royal family wanted him to stay very safely at home, but he insisted on uh, being part of the action and, and wanted to go to the front lines uh, in France. And he didn't actually see any action, of course, and he was quite, kept quite safe, but he was permitted to go to the front lines. So he had, he, he had a terrible relationship with his father and uh, he really wanted to do things differently as a prince and as a monarch and he felt very confined and, and constrained by 
all of the protocol and not being able to make any political statements about anything and just going along and cutting ribbons and sitting there while <clears throat> these ceremonial sort of things went on. But uh, I think he was very deeply affected by what he saw of the action in, in the war. But on leave, he was in Paris and he met uh, a, a courtesan called Marguerite. Uh, at the time, her name was Mella because she married a couple of times or she claimed she did anyway. So she was she was a high class Parisian courtesan of the Gigi variety. She had done all of the the uh, training and um, really was trained to be the companion of princes and, and and industrialists and very wealthy men. So this was basically his first real romantic liaison that we know about. Uh, so he was very fresh and <laughs> innocent and sort of new <laughs> and she was quite seasoned by this stage. She was older than he was. And so this is the, the part of what inspired the Royal Windsor Secret, this relationship between Marguerite and the Prince of Wales. So then the story moves forward with the girl who is now 16, 17, and uh, we're in the 1930s, 1935, 36, and in 36, Edward VIII ascends the throne when his father dies. And so we have Cleo going to her presentation and she's presented to the king, the man she thinks might be her father. So that sort of drama ensues in that. And then uh, we actually move through to the abdication. So Edward VIII fell in love with Wallace Simpson and uh, because she was a divorcee, he was the head of the Church of England and there was uh, also a rule that... Um, that direct descendants of Queen Victoria could not marry divorcees. So, uh, and there were other reasons why Wallace was really seen to be unacceptable <laughs> to the British. Uh, and, and we can go into that a bit later. But uh, so 1936 at the, in December, uh, Edward VIII abdicated the throne. He left being a monarch because he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson. And so his brother stepped up and uh, had the same coronation date and everything. He just he just stepped into his shoes. And I think a lot of people know about that from the King's speech and the crown and things like that. So uh, this is the time period we're really looking at in my book. And then after that, the uh, Edward VIII becomes the Duke of Windsor and um, things ensue from there. So my book spans about 1918 to 1952. So it's a sweeping saga. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so uh, when we have Bryn's books, that sort of slots in between those 1918 and and um, the, the 1936 time that my book picks up again. Yeah, it definitely sounds uh, ripe for drama and perfect for a story and and use of your imagination. So, Bryn, why don't you fill us in from there? Um, talk a, if you could talk a little bit about Wallace Simpson, and then, of course, as your novel is titled, "Who Is the Woman Before Wallace?" Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, as, as Christine said, my book kind of like just nestles itself right into this other period of Edward VIII's life when he had um, other affairs. Uh, Marguerite was not the only woman in Edward's life prior to him meeting and marrying Wallace Simpson. He actually had, um, he had two very prominent mistresses prior to Wallace. One was a woman named uh, Frida Dudley Ward, who he met in the 1920s and carried on quite a long and um, intimate relationship with. And then the other one uh, who's the subject of my novel is Thelma Furness, who was with Edward up to the point where he met Wallace Simpson. And she actually was the woman who introduced him to Wallace. She was one of Wallace's very good friends. And the apocryphal story goes that the reason Edward and Wallace got together 
was because Telma, um, who like Wallace, Edward had a real thing for Americans. So, Ed, so like Wallace, Telma was American and she was a divorcee. And she had to go to the United States to support her sister in a very contentious custody battle called the Matter of Vanderbilt. And before she left, she took Wallace out to the Ritz Hotel in London, said to Wallace, you know, darling, Edward is gonna be very lonely without me. Will you look after him while I'm gone? And Wallace leaned across the table, patted Thomas' hand and said, of course, darling, of course, I'll look after him for you. And that, of course, proved to be kind of Telma's undoing in this relationship with Edward. Um, of course, the wheels had fallen off of the relationship a little bit before then. Edward was a notoriously difficult man and a notoriously difficult partner, romantic partner. Um, he was very clingy, very needy. And he also, he really just, as Christine said, he had no, no interest in his royal duties, which I think really, um, it weighed on him and it weighed on the women that he was with. So when, when Wallace Simpson comes along, Wallace is this woman, she represents everything that the crown is not. She's an American, she's a divorcee, she's very brash, she's an outsider completely to the system. Unlike Talma, who actually had married into the British aristocracy, Wallace was this absolute outsider. And so when Edward chose to you know, pursue her, he was choosing to pursue a path that really could not have ended in any other way but abdication. Um, I think it was a very conscious choice on his part to go down that road and to choose women consciously who would have resulted in nothing other than an abdication because it was nothing that he had ever wanted. He had no interest in that world. Um, and then, of course, you know, we move forward as Christine does. Uh, in her book, and Edward's life kind of, I don't think, turned out the way that he'd intended it to. Uh, I think he ended up being rather bitter um, in the bed that he'd made. Yeah, I think that's so true, and I, I got that impression from my research as well, that he he completely did not want that role. He wanted to, mm -hmm. to either be sort of this statesman kind of person who interfered in the political scenarios um, but really, he didn't have the the intelligence or the 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 you know the mindset to do that. But that's how he saw himself as this sort of statesman kind of person. Uh, but he certainly didn't want to be be doing what the royal family wanted him to do, and that was just be the the you know he was very attractive he people thought he was like a movie star I mean he was the most eligible black bachelor on the planet uh and oh yeah, yeah he really turned his back on all of that and and it, it's all very well to say oh he fell in love with Wallace which he did he absolutely I mean that whatever she felt he absolutely adored her but I feel that if he had wanted to be king, he would have been king. And I think if the establishment had wanted him to be king, they would have made sure he was. But I think, wasn't it that Tommy Lascelles, you know, he's in the crown and everything, and he said the best thing for Britain would be if he, you know, broke his neck on the hunting field because we just, he's just going to be the downfall of the monarchy if he remains king. Well, absolutely. I mean, the fact of the matter was he was not a good statesman. He was somebody who had been told yes his whole life. He was incredibly handsome. Mm -hmm. He had charisma like you wouldn't believe. Like all of that is true. But was he an intelligent man? Was he was he politically astute? Absolutely not. And, you know, I, I think one of the interesting things, I don't know, Christine, you came across this in your research, but um, one of the things that I found very interesting was with uh, so Wallace, one of the reasons that the establishment really, really couldn't stand Wallace was because she would take, she took an active interest in the affairs of the crown. So, you know, if you've watched, if you've watched the crown, you'll know the big red boxes where, and that's the box that the monarch gets all of the, um, you know, all of the information of state for the day comes in these big red boxes. And the deal is nobody is supposed to look in those boxes, but the monarch. And when these boxes would be sent to Edward after his father's death, before he was coronated, 
these boxes would come back and Wallace would have written all over them. And she would have provided her opinions on what was happening. And of course, um, as an American um, and, and crucially as someone who had, uh, you know, right-wing leanings in the 1930s, this was a very, very dangerous thing um, for the establishment to see. And so one of the things that I thought was very interesting was at one point the government actually went, they, they actually met and they discussed the possibility of bringing back Telma and saying, if Edward wants his American, if he wants his American divorcee, Telma is not political. Telma is not gonna, muck, she's not gonna be like mud in the spokes of the wheel, right? She is gonna be fine. But Wallace Simpson is a dangerous person politically for him to be aligned with because he has no thoughts of his own in his head. He's just gonna parrot whatever, you know, whatever somebody tells him. Yeah, absolutely. And there was a rumor that she had been involved with Ribbentrop, who was the German mm -hmm. ambassador at the time. So um, <laughs> sent, and the, he sent her and, 19 carnations every day. Yes, yes. Why? Yeah. So uh, I, I think that, I mean, obviously, even during the war, they were still talking with the Nazis. And uh, you know, in my book, the, there's a, a few incidents where uh, they just assume that the couple, the Windsors, assume that the Germans will help them out getting all their things from, from France. And they absolutely will because the Germans wanted to cozy up to the Duke of Windsor. Hitler had this plan that he quite liked Britain and he he wanted to sort of, um, I, I imagine it would have been an occupation, but he didn't want to invade Britain. He wanted them to throw in their lot with him and he would have turned on them eventually, no doubt. But uh, I think Ed, um, Edward, David, it, it's so hard in my book because he's <laughs> three different people throughout this and, and he's got two Christian names. So you never quite know how to refer to him. But <laughs> it, it, let's call him Edward VIII um, or the Duke of Windsor by this time. He, he saw him, Hitler saw him as a puppet king so this was really attractive to him to be brought back as a king in Britain and Wallace would be his queen. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it's not exactly substantiated, I think, but it's fairly, you know, that it's a fairly good case that I saw that said he actually said to the Nazis, I'm going to the Bahamas, but I'll be ready at any moment to you know, step in if I'm needed. And what did that mean? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Well, you, so. think, you think about, you think about those quirks of history, right? Like it is, it was such a, a, a momentous thing at the time for him to abdicate. Like it, it almost broke the monarchy. It was, it was the biggest, most historic event that could ever possibly happen. And we look at it now and we think, well, thank God it did because Britain ended up with the king that it needed during the war. And Edward would not have been that king. I I have very little doubt that he would not have pulled Britain together in the way that his brother George did. No, well, he was reported to have even said that the Germans should bomb the hell out of, um, the heck out of uh, Britain <laughs> so that they'd surrender quickly and there wouldn't be a big war. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that stemmed not, so much from being a, a traitor as having seen the carnage of World War One and not wanting that to be revisited. And he, he'd mm -hmm. also been quite well acquainted with the might of Germany at that time because Germany had been rearming while Britain was still, you know, they had World War I tanks or, you know, the, their equipment was completely outdated. They were completely unprepared for World War II. And uh, and so I mm -hmm. think he thought that the Germans would win anyway. Why not sue for peace? Exactly. You two have been calling on a lot about this, the history, and of course about Edward VIII, and it's very fascinating, and it's wonderful to hear you two, you know, the the, the expertise you have in that history. But you do write historical fiction, so let me steer the conversation toward the fiction elements of your novels for just a little bit. Um, Christine, you have created a character in Cleo Davenport. Can you tell us who she represents and why you decided to do that? 
I wanted to write about somebody who was possibly a child of of this liaison between Edward VIII and Marguerite. Marguerite was not a good good character as a protagonist because she's not a very likable character. So she is, she does have a point of view, but she's uh, she's the wicked woman of the of the piece. And so Cleo is completely made up. Uh, she she's not. But, but there are elements of real people in her. So, um, for example, uh, she Cleo is in Cairo during World War II, and so there's a wonderful memoir by Hermione Ranfurly, uh, uh, the Countess, I think she was, and uh, it's called To War with Whitaker. And so there's a lot of Hermione in Cleo's adventures uh, in during World War II and just... It was amazing to see that uh, even though there was a serious business of war going on, people are always going to find a way to enjoy themselves in between. And Cairo was a, a place where people would, you know, go to work during the day and maybe take the next the afternoon off to play polo or uh, and go to balls at night. So uh, that was a really fascinating juxtaposition. Uh, and then be, because Cleo also, her, her burning ambition is to be a jewellery designer. And there is a French designer called Suzanne Belperon who uh, got frustrated working for another firm because they wouldn't let her sign her work. And she eventually set up business on her own with the help of uh, a Jewish businessman. And uh, it's very, it's quite a poignant story because, of course, when the Nazis occupied France, <clears> that all anybody, any Jewish person who had a business, had to surrender it. So uh, she took over the business on her own, but at the end of the war, she gave it back to the family because, uh, you know, unlike Chanel, <laughs> who completely took advantage of the, mm -hmm. oh, and got her perfume. Uh, rights back uh, by dobbing in those Jewish men who had bought the rights to to manufacture her perfume. Uh, and Suzanne Belperon did the right thing, and so uh, she inspired Cleo as well as you know one of the few women in that industry. It's a completely male dominated industry at, at this stage of of history, and probably still is, I'd say. And Bryn, your your novel focuses on Thel Thelma Morgan, who you've talked about a little bit already. Mm -hmm. um, can you go a little bit more in, in depth about who she was and what her background was and how she ended up in the British aristocracy? Absolutely. Uh, before I do that, I do have to say, Christine, you'd posted about uh, To War with Whitaker, the memoir, and Hermione's memoir, and I I bought it that day. So it's sitting at home. I'm up in my cottage right now, but it's sitting at home, like waiting for me. And I cannot wait to dive in because it just sounds like the greatest memoir ever. So I'm very excited oh, to read it. You'll love it. You <laughs> you will love it. She's charming. She's just delightful. Oh, I have I have very little doubt. I, I'm, I'm going to do anything other than love it. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Um. So anyway, so my book uh, is about Talma Furness. So Talma was, um, she was this American socialite. I kind of looked at her as like an early Kardashian almost. She was famous for being famous and she was famous for being pretty. That's kind of what she was at the time. And she had a twin sister named Gloria who ended up marrying into the mighty Vanderbilt family. Uh, she married one of the sons, Reginald Vanderbilt and her daughter, little Gloria, actually became uh, Gloria the fa the fashion designer, artist, uh, philanthropist that we know um, who very famously designed jeans and is Anderson Cooper's mother. So that's all on one side of, of Telma's family tree. But Telma in the 1920s, she went to a party that was thrown by her sister and Reggie uh, where she met Marmaduke Furness, who was the wealthiest man in Britain at the time. He was a Viscount, um, he was a shipping industrialist and he had just absolute zonks of money. And she married him. Um, it was, it was, I would say, at the beginning, a love match. But Thelma didn't realize that love in the high, higher echelons of, of upper class British society 
uh, actually involves sleeping around a little bit. So she goes into this as this American, more middle class, upper middle class woman. She kind of ends up in this fish out of water scenario where her husband is having affairs on her and she's kind of expected to just go along with it. And she doesn't particularly want to do that. That's not what she's, um, you know, that's not of interest to her until she meets um, Edward, uh, Edward VIII at a county fair and she embarks on this four-year relationship with him. And so Telma was involved with him from 1929 to 1934. And, um, you know, during that time, she just kind of went along. She was easy. She was, she was just this very kind of easy to get along with, lovely, I would say almost like an innocent person. Like she didn't, she wasn't a, she wasn't really a schemer. Um, the way that I would say Telma or that I would say Wallace was. Um, but she did have this sort of, she had this sort of celebrity about her through uh, through her sister. They were known in, in the years prior to her moving to the, to the UK, they were known as the Magnificent Morgan Twins. And so what ended up happening was Telma's sister, Gloria, when Reginald dies, Reginald Vanderbilt died very shortly after she married him, leaving her with this child, little Gloria, and Gloria Sr. gets taken to court by the Vanderbilt family because she's seen as an unfit mother. And it was it was called the trial of the century at the time because it took place, like think about it, it takes place during the Great Depression where people are just scraping to get money on the table. And here is the wealthiest family, one of the wealthiest families in the country, going to war over a gigantic inheritance that is being visited upon this little girl. And so Tama goes to support her sister because uh, one of the big reasons that the sister was being brought up on these custody trial, you know, being up on these charges was because uh, she was, she had a relationship with a woman uh, who was actually a cousin of Edward VIII's, not a Milford Haven. And so, you know, British and American royalty kind of clashed in this custody battle that Telma was in the middle of as the link between American and British royalty, so to speak. So I thought she was just the most fascinating character. I found her, believe it or not, in a movie directed by Madonna. Um, she was very glancingly referenced in a movie called WE, if anyone's seen it. And uh, I couldn't believe like going on to her Wikipedia page, I just couldn't believe that nobody had written a story about her. Um, so I did. <laughs> That's one solution. Um, <laughs> I wonder if uh, the two of you could both kind of talk about what it's like for you to kind of get at the emotional truths uh, of this story, because you must have had to have parsed through so much research and so much of what's already been said about these people in this time period. So how did you kind of figure out what was true and what wasn't and how you should portray it in your stories to bring these characters to life? Uh, Christine, why don't you go start us off on that? Oh, uh, I think that this, with this book especially, I just happily grabbed at the most dramatic interpretation so there is an incident, uh, you know, if you read about Marguerite, uh, the, the French courtesan, she was an absolutely scandalous character. I mean, that the, her affair with Edward VIII was the least of it. <laughs> and uh, there, there, is, uh, there are a couple of books by a, um, a, a British lawyer, actually. I think he was once a judge. And he, 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 what his uh, ethos is, he takes trials from history and, and works out whether there was a miscarriage of justice. And uh, Marguerite was actually put on trial for murder. She uh, shot dead her Egyptian husband in the Savoy Hotel in London and, uh, you know, shot him several times, once in the head. There was a witness. And she got off, <laughs> acquitted, not even manslaughter. She was completely found not guilty. So uh, there's a little bit of conspiracy theory and 
very well reasoned uh, uh, theory about what happened and why she she was uh, found not guilty. So that's in the book. So instead of saying, was that really true? Do we have you know, solid evidence for that? I don't know that we would be able to adduce evidence in a trial, but the circumstantial evidence was pretty strong. So I was happy to run with that theory <laughs> and dramatise that in my book. But if you ask me hand on heart, did that actually happen? I probably would have to say there's not enough evidence to really prove it. So uh, I'm a former lawyer, so I <laughs> I really enjoyed that that analysis that uh, Andrew Rose did about about that trial. So I think the answer to your question is I where I do deviate or where I have taken the more dramatic view, I always say so in the author's note, uh, and I say what what I've what I've fictionalized and what I haven't. Uh, as far as the emotional through line goes, I think uh, I, 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 you know, when you're reading and you, especially with direct quotations and there's so much about uh, Edward VIII that's been written and dramatized and everything, I think you just get a sense of what you think that character would be like. And as Bryn said, you know, he was completely almost sycophantic in a way to his mistresses. Even though there was a core to him that was still, I'm I'm the one who makes decisions here. Uh, yeah, it, 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 I have him, he's quite a fawning kind of character in my book towards Wallace and, um, and so that's how I saw him. So, you know, I guess interpretations differ and there's no one correct one, but uh, that's how I portrayed him. So, yeah, I think you just get a sense. And then for me, writing's almost like acting. You know, I just sort of feel the characters as I'm writing and that's how they come out. So it's a little bit of alchemy as well as, uh, as a logical uh, conclusion. And Bryn, how about you? And how did how did you parse through the research and bring your characters to life? So um, I mentioned earlier, this is my first novel. And when I started writing it, I was like, it's going to be true to fact. If it rained on the day, it's going to rain on the day in my book. And these are the people who are going to be the da 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 da. I, sweet little innocent lamb that I was. Um, because you get to the point where you're like, I need to be telling a story. And that's at the heart of what I'm doing. I'm not telling, I'm not writing a nonfiction book. I'm not writing biography. I'm writing a story. And, and so at certain points you have to kind of let the story take over. Um, and, and you have to let the story breathe life between those facts. So I will say like in this book, um, the research that I did was, was a lot and it stays true to fact. I would say 85% of the book is true to fact. Um, you know, so if, if Telma's at a party, she was actually at that party. The people that she speaks to were, were actually there, but the, the great fun and the great artistry that we're able to do as historical fiction authors is we're able to kind of ascribe motive to our characters and we're able to kind of give them that inner monologue that is missing from that historical record. So if the historical record says Telma was in this room, she walks into the party with, with Marmaduke Furness. She leaves it three hours later with Edward. We don't necessarily know what happened in those three hours. And that's where our playground is because we know that they have to get from point A to point B, but how we are gonna do it is, is up to us. And you know, with, with these characters, Edward and, and Wallace Simpson are one of the most written about uh, couples in history. We know everything about them. We have their letters, we have recordings, we have newspaper articles. And, and I was really lucky because Talma actually wrote a, a memoir. She wrote a joint autobiography with her sister, Gloria. So I was able to kind of use all of those sources and pull them together to kind of get to the heart of, of these characters in a way that I, I really hope came across as, um, as authentic. One of the things uh, I always say 
is that if my characters were to walk through my front door, if a historical person were, would, were to walk through the front door, I would want them to recognize themselves in my portrayal of who they are. They may not have to agree with absolutely everything, but I would want them to be able to say, yeah, you know what, it was honest, um, mainly because I don't want to get haunted, so. <laughs> I think that's a yeah, that's Wallace a Simpson's going to be coming for me. I think. <laughs> uh -oh. She's going to be sitting in your living room with a cigarette in her lacquered hands, going, "We have a bone to pick with you." <laughs> I'd be very scared. <laughs> well, I, I can only speak for myself, but one thing that occurred to me is, as as someone who has no connection to the aristocracy or to vast wealth. Um, how challenging was it for either of you to kind of put yourself in the shoes of these extremely wealthy, extremely powerful people and then be able to put it onto the page in a way that puts readers in a situation that I'm guessing you haven't been in before? Um, Christine, what, what do you think on that? Oh, I, I don't, I mean, I guess I've written about wealthy people quite a lot over the course of my career and uh, I suppose there's a bit of aspiration in there in some respects. I, I think I found it very, very difficult to understand the level of material interest that and, you know, just the the sheer greed of Wallace Simpson and and even Edward VIII because the the things that they reportedly did to get the money that they spent on all of these amazing jewels. I mean, jewels, jewelry is a real theme of this book. And uh, Wallace Simpson had one of the most famous and significant collections of jewelry. I mean, she was a, a real style icon. And uh, so writing about people who were more concerned about their material goods arriving safely than they were about the people who were being bombed and, you know, things happening all over Europe uh, just boggles the mind. So, yeah, it was it was difficult because you try to write every character with empathy and compassion and I couldn't, it, it was very difficult to find any empathy for that attitude. <laughs> it was just, yeah, it was quite beyond my belief and and just you know on the other side being the sort of person who could buy jewelry worth fifty thousand dollars or what have you I just yeah my mind boggles I have a friend who has a Cartier Panther bracelet so yeah that's about uh, as close as, close as I get my dream my dream <laughs> piece of jewelry <laughs> it's just yeah absolutely gorgeous you know the the artistry and in getting that panther to look so lifelike it, one of the designer who was really famous for those those pieces is in the book too so yeah christine is there isn't there a story about a teal bathing suit just on <laughs> yeah. on the subject of getting material goods out of war-torn europe yeah uh yes they uh wallace and edward had to flee france and they drove into Spain and then to Portugal. And when she arrived in Portugal, Wallace realized she didn't have her favorite swimsuit. It was O'Donnell and it brought out the color of her eyes, her famous blue eyes. And she uh, was very concerned. And she said, we need to go back and get my <laughs> swimsuit. And the British wouldn't let her. So uh, they arranged for the Americans to send it in a diplomatic bag. <laughs> this is the oh level of yeah, oh my God. There. yeah well Bryn did you have any trouble uh empathizing I couldn't say <laughs> empathizing with these the people that you're writing about oh well you know uh in terms of like tapping into that world um as Christine said aspiration I would also say delusion played a large part of it in my case um I I was really lucky. So when I when I started writing this book, I was working a corporate job in Toronto um, in this cubicle. It, the job was very much not not a fit for me. And I started writing the book while I was at that job. And it got to a point where I realized, like, I am spending more time at my at this work thinking about 
the woman before Wallace than I am thinking about my clients. So I need to take this seriously. So I quit the job and I applied to do a master's in creative writing at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, thinking, okay, the book's going to be set in the UK. It'll give me the opportunity to do some on the ground research. I'll be able to, you know, give myself a year of time to see if this is really a thing that I can pursue. So I go to Scotland and I join this university and I kind of didn't realize at the time, you know, I knew that St. Andrews was a very, you know, ancient and highfalutin kind of university, but I didn't realize just the level of wealth that the students had there. Like I'm coming into this, I'm this little middle-class Canadian and I'm hanging out with people who are complaining because the, um, the calf on their polo boot has gotten a bit tight. And so they're gonna have to take it to their personal cobbler to have that taken out. Um, at one point I was invited to a party where um, instead of playing beer pong with, you know, Molson Canadian, like I would, uh, they were playing with Dom Perignon. Like this is the level of just wealth that these students had. And I just was kind of gobsmacked by it. So I kind of gained a little bit of a sense of what Telma would have gone through, I think. Like it gave me a bit of an appreciation for that kind of fish out of water feeling of like, what am I, where am I? What is this place? Like, you know, I, I like I, I would go to the, uh, I go to the charity shops and there would be like thousand pound designer dresses that students would have donated after like a single wear to a cocktail party. It was just wild. And so, you know, I kind of got, I kind of got a sense of that um, a little bit, but then, you know, in terms of, in terms of empathizing with it, it was really difficult to do because these characters are, are living during the great depression and to them, it's nothing to them. It's just like, it's threadbare people waiting outside a courthouse while they're walking in swathed in furs to bicker about millions of dollars. It just, it, it really astounded me that they were so removed from it when it was just it when it was looking them in the face and that that I found very very difficult to contend with but I I think you do I think you see in your book I mean so sensitively that you dealt with how you can have millions of dollars and still be the unhappiest person mm -hmm. in, in that you, Selma went through so much in that book and uh, I always think there are very wealthy people and that's great that I don't have to worry about where, you know, that's a huge thing not to have to worry about how you're going to pay your rent and how, where your food's going to come from, but they have their own problems and it's not necessarily just the, the, the calf mm -hmm. of a polo boot. They have emotional lives as well. And that's what you brought out in the woman before Wallace. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's true. You know, it's true. And I think I think that the heart of historical fiction, and you do this as well with with Cleo, the heart of historical fiction is empathy, right? It's it's being able to step into your character's shoes, and gain an appreciation for what they're going through. Even you know, it's not your lived experience. That's not what matters. What matters is, you know, what matters is am I am I portraying this person with empathy, and you know, in the case of Cleo, in the case of Telma, that's that's what we're striving to do. Well, I want to invite uh, questions from the audience. So if you've mm -hmm. got a question, please post it in the chat. And I see we've got one from Edie. And she asks, how important is it to portray women's roles in historical fiction? Um, so Bryn, what do you think about that? Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the reasons that women um, gravitate towards historical fiction and women's stories are told so often in historical fiction is because for the vast majority of recorded history, particularly in the Western world, um, history has been written by the victors and the victors have been men. And as a result, women's stories are often lost um, in those official records of what happened and what was important because women are not the ones writing it. So I think, I think historical fiction, we have a very, um, we, we have a role to play in bringing these, with these women and bringing their stories back to light and, and introducing them to new audiences because their stories are important and they matter. 
and you know writing about these women with the empathy and with the you know the due diligence that they deserve i think is is uh, it's a task that i certainly don't take lightly Christine, Christine, what are your, yeah, what do you think? Know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree. And also, I think there are a lot of women who are lost to history who, you know, we see certain eras that women were a certain way. And we think that because perhaps there's a television series that have shown women in the kitchen and women doing the domestic things, say, in the 1950s and things like that. Whereas, uh, from my research, I see all these amazing women who were beyond anything anything that you would see in the cliches of, of that era. They just had such a modern mindset if I, you know, they thought they could do anything. And, and bringing those kinds of women to the fore has really been my focus as well because... Uh, you know, Cleo just never entertains the notion that just because she's a woman, she can't do something. She was lucky enough to be brought up by a very intelligent woman who was an archaeologist. So obviously she had that advantage. But there have been many women trailblazers in history. Um, so often, though, unfortunately, because of how they're viewed, a lot of the time they, they're viewed as not very likable. So <laughs> you have to kind of delve a little bit to see, well, is that just the, the view of the patriarchy at the time or, you know, mm -hmm. were they, or did they have to be quite strident and prickly and, and so forth to get what they wanted? And I know a lot of people have read a Lessons in Chemistry and loved it. And I think Elizabeth Stott is one of those characters where, she just, she was so brilliant. She just didn't entertain the fact that some people thought she shouldn't be able to do things because she's a woman. And I think there are plenty of women like that throughout history who we just never hear from. So that brings, you know, Bryn actually gave the answer I would have given us that we need to fill these gaps in the historical record. And we can, because there's often so, I mean, it's so I'm so jealous that you had a a memoir um, or autobiography from from Thelma mm -hmm. because so often as in you know Sisters of the Resistance I wrote about Catherine Dior there was so mm -hmm. little on record about her experience partly because she never spoke about it um, she lived and she was such a remarkable time. woman yeah she was such yeah. a remarkable woman and all everybody talks about is Christian. And not Christine. That's, yes, that's true. And and I think she didn't really want, she seemed to be the sort of person who did not want to be in the spotlight. She was very happy to be curating her brother's work. And, you know, she was in the French resistance and sent to Ravensbrück and all of that, but she didn't want to talk about that. So uh, fictionalising it is really one of the only ways we can talk about characters like her in, yeah. in depth. Yeah, absolutely. I um sorry, my dogs are my dogs are barking and they're driving me crazy. <laughs> um you know, I, you know there's that line uh, well-behaved women seldom make history, right? And I think yeah. that that uh I think that's such an apt thing to say. That's such a perfect encapsulation of what that of that exact sentiment. So, yeah. Well, uh, Janilyn asks, uh, what is the most difficult thing about writing historical fiction for you? Uh, Christine, I know mm. you talked about being starting off as a lawyer, uh, so that must have been a little bit of a challenge or a shift for you. What, what were some of the challenges for uh, writing historical fiction for you? Uh, I think shifting from, I mean, it's a long time ago now that I was a lawyer, so uh, I think I've worked myself out of the habit, but I used to write very succinctly, you know, it was like this happened, then this happened. And it's like, no, you got to stop and smell the roses and put in description and slow it down and all of that. So that was what I mm -hmm. had to learn coming out of, of the law. But I, um, historical fiction is, you know, I, th I think there's so many ideas that come out of reading about history that I, 
I feel like for me it's easier than it would be if it was contemporary fiction or you know people always talk about oh the re- there's so much research but the research is but the research is the well, best part yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think I think all historical fiction writers have to learn as Bryn said to, it's a story and uh sometimes when I've stuck too close to the the timeline and the, the exactly what happened I'm not I'm not telling a story so my editor has said well you know like you can fictionalize this a little bit more uh mm-hmm. so yeah that's what I've I've learned and it's a real skill to tell a story uh but still get a, it as as bright as you possibly can and Bryn, are there any challenges for you that we haven't already kind of covered? Oh, well, I mean, I think I think one of the main challenges, honestly, is motivation. It's it, it's one thing to say, oh, this is a really interesting historical figure and I want to write about them. And it's another thing to sit down on the desk every day and and do the research and 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 parse out of that research a, a coherent narrative. In a narrative that isn't just about that one person's experience, but what's the broader story that you're trying to, you know, what's the broader lesson? I, I hate that word, but what's the broader kind of experience that you're looking to show your readers? Um, I think that 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 for me is is really difficult to do on the day to day basis. Um, but you do have to just kind of keep putting one foot in front of the other and forging ahead. And and some you know someday you look down at your word count, and you think, oh gosh, this is a book. <laughs> and isn't that wonderful? <laughs> well, Bren, can you expand on that a little bit? Because Carol asked, "What what are your what are the our author's writing process?" So, I mean, what is it like yeah. for you to? How do you find that motivation? Do you have to schedule your time, and how how does that work for you? So, writing is my nine to five job, and and I try to kind of keep it more or less within those hours, um, day to day. And so, for me, every book starts with the historical record because if you don't kind of develop that historical record fully, you, there's kind of no point in setting your characters in that historical time period if you're not playing against the lived historical experience. So I start with like a really, really deep dive into the years and months um, of the time and place in question. So I'll look at the, you know, socioeconomic, cultural, um, you know, kind of the, the the entirety of what I can find, and I'll build this database of what's happening. And the story will kind of work itself around that. So from there, I'll dive into, okay, who are my characters? What do I want them to be doing? In the case of The Woman Before Wallace, that that process was easier because I had Telma's uh, memoir to work off of, and I had her lived experiences. Um, with my most recent book, I had to come up with that from scratch because they were purely historical, uh, or, you know, they were purely fictional characters. So how are those characters, how are their lived experiences going to be informed by the world that they grew up in, that kind of thing? Uh, then from there, I am, um, you know, there, there are two kind of schools of thought when it comes to drafting a novel. You can be a plotter or a pantser. Um, I am very much a plotter, sometimes plotter with two T's, sometimes plotter with two D's. And, um, you know, I will kind of break down the story chapter by chapter and look into, okay, what's the broad arc that I want to follow? And from there, I'll build kind of my detailed outline. And that's what I work from. And so in terms of, you know, going back to the question of motivation, it's easier to kind of have that motivation when you have, for me, at least when I have that roadmap to work off of, because even if I'm sitting down and going, I'm not really feeling very inspired today. I know because I have that roadmap in front of me, okay, well, this is what I need to get down on the page. So I can build from there and kind of go. That's, that's fascinating. So um, like you said, it's your nine to five job. There's a Mm -hmm. kind of like a, yeah, the research is fun, but it's kind of interesting to hear that business element to it, to it, that you have your deadlines and you have to, you have your process in order to, to accomplish those deadlines. Christine, how about your mm-hmm. process? Oh, I'm a little bit different. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, for many, many years, I was a full-time writer. And just recently, a friend asked me to come and do technical writing at their engineering firm, which is quite a different kind of 
<laughs> it's a very uh, different kind of writing. Very different. Uh, so I, I do, I have found that uh, previously I never would do a word, write to a word count. You know, so a lot of writers say, I'm going to do a thousand words today and they do that and that's it. Or, you know, anything more is, is gravy. Uh, and I, I used to say, no, I just sit down at the same time every day and whatever happens, happens, because I used to find that if I set a word count, I'd write rubbish just to get to the word count and and doing it the, the way I did it, I might write 3,000 words a day, I might write no words a day, it just would depend on on how I felt and and whether the story was coming and I very much envy plotters because of that because I would love to say okay it's this scene today and I do I do to a certain extent I think you have to as a story you know I mm -hmm. I work through a timeline and I say okay I've got this fence post this fence post so I've got to get from here to there you know obviously I wanted to start the Royal Windsor Secret with Cleo uh, going off to England from Cairo to be presented and and have her debut. That was mine. So, so I wanted her to be presented to the king. So that had to be 1936 that she did that working. You know, I had all of these fence posts of historical events, things that I knew were set in stone and had to happen. And then I write around that. But uh, from a day to day, now that I've got this job, it's made me a lot more productive <laughs> because I know I can't mess around. I, I have to get my words done. So what I do now is wake up. I wake up at 4 a.m. I know that's everybody thinks oh. I'm crazy. Yes, I know. Oh. I wake up at 4 a.m. <laughs> I sit in bed with a cup of coffee and just write my words for the day before I even get up. And if I don't finish my word count, uh, I'm really lucky because my work is flexible. So I don't go to work until I've finished my word count. So I might not arrive at work until 9.30 <laughs> or, you know, I might get there early because I've, I've blitzed those words for the day. So that's, that's how I'm doing it now. And it seems to be working very, touch wood, seems to be working very well, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I do have to, I've got a bit of a mess on my hands at the moment, so I have to just keep going and then I'll fix it later. And that does stress me out. I'd like to not have a mess. Usually I don't have a mess. So I go over what I did the previous day and then move forward. But oh, this one's <laughs> <laughs> I'm at about 75,000 words of the next book. And uh yeah oh that's good it needs to be fixed though so <laughs> yeah and I can understand how that might definitely weigh on you throughout your day and you can't wait to get back to it and figure it out mm -hmm. there's no I wrong that, way you know I'm sorry go ahead yeah yeah I think that's part of the good thing about having to do this other job that it's so boring it's just so boring <laughs> and I love the people. I love the the firm, and that's why I'm staying. But and the money, <laughs> but it's really, really boring. You know, writing CVs for engineers and learning about cut and covered tunnels and goodness knows what like cable it's, stay it's... bridges, and <laughs> uh, and so it's so nice to get back to the the writing. And I, I think when you do make it a full time job, it it starts to feel like a job sometimes you have to re refresh mm -hmm. your your motivation and your love for that book you have to be in love with your book but sometimes it's really hard <laughs> very much so very much so you know I, I love though being able to use both sides of your brain that way though like having something that's completely separate from it I feel like that kind of gives you a good mental kind of peace a little bit I I find whenever I'm like stuck, I have to do something that's completely not related whatsoever to the novel in order to get out of it. Sometimes it's exercise, sometimes it's a different project. Sometimes, honestly, it's getting a manicure. The number of times where I've been getting a manicure and I've been like, that's how I'm gonna deal with that. And then the poor nail technician has to sit there as I'm going like, okay, no, but like this is gonna happen and then this can happen. Da, 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 da. Anyway, I tip very well when that happens. <laughs> 
<laughs> nice. Well, we're up on the end of the hour here. I, I do want to ask two quick questions before we go. Um, before I get to those, I want to thank everyone for participating, for coming. I want to thank um, our panelists, Bryn and Christine. This has been a wonderful conversation. It's been wonderful to hear you talk about the history and your process and all those things. Um, I also want to thank uh, those who did contribute financially because this is a free event, but I there was an option to to donate some money and that helps me to pay the bills to keep the the zoom panel going um so i really appreciate those who were able to who were able to contribute that way um so to end i i want to ask two things first where can readers connect with you do you have a newsletter um that they can subscribe to and or maybe on social media um Bryn, do where can readers connect with you yeah uh, so i'm most active on instagram at Bryn turnbull writes also at Facebook, uh, same handle. And then my website, BrynTurnbull.com. Uh, I am actually right now running a, um, a little giveaway for my newsletter subscribers. So if you subscribe before September 20th, you'll be entered to win a chance uh, to win signed copies of The Paris Deception and Janie Chang's most recent release, The Porcelain Moon. So uh, hop on over to BrynTurnbull.com if those books are of interest to you. Wonderful. And Christine, where can readers connect with you? Uh, I'm on Instagram at Christine Wells, uh, it, sorry, uh, <laughs> underscore, yeah, but you'll find me, and um, my website's christine-wells.com, so you can join my newsletter via via that, and I'm also on Facebook at Christine Wells Author, so uh, yeah, and, and I just wanted to say thank you everybody for coming along, it's been a great discussion, and thank you to Colin as well, yeah. Of course. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And Colin. And yeah, this has been so much fun. And let me just just end with I always want to end with something, you know, related to history, related to historical fiction. Um, and so maybe if you could just briefly kind of summarize your answer here. But what what lessons are there for us today in your novels? Because um, you know, obviously the British royal family is in the news a lot. There's no shortage of drama. I imagine the, a show like The Crown just gets more and more content all the time. So if you could put it briefly, um, what can we take away from looking at, you know, your time period and what happened then uh, for us to today? Um, Christine, what do you think? Oh, well, for, from the royal point of view, I think uh, we need to, you know, I, I think the lesson is that Queen Elizabeth II has been, you know, that line, they've just been the most responsible royals of the family. And they they, you know, show show us a shining example of duty and and, and uh selflessness in many ways, as opposed to Edward VIII. But I think what I'd like people to take away from the Royal Windsor Secret is that it's not about who your parents are it's you know the the Brody says it's not about who who where you've come from it's where you're going and that's the lesson that Cleo learns and she learns to be independent and stand on her own two feet well said Bryn how about you uh, you know, I, I like to say that The Woman Before Wallace is a love story, but it's not a royal romance. Um, it's a book about the love between sisters. And that's the thing that, that that's the lesson. And that's the thing that I really kind of love when people kind of connect to that aspect of the book. It's it's about it's about sisters and it's about, um, you know, it's about sisters standing up to authority and standing up to power. Uh, in a time and a place where women really weren't supposed to do that. And that I think is um, is really quite admirable. I would also like to say on the subject of the royal family, I agree with everything uh, Christine said. I would also like to say they're the longest running soap opera in history. And that I think is what makes them so fascinating to historical fiction authors. Yeah. Well, thanks well again. To, <laughs> thanks again to everyone. And Christine, congratulations on your new release. And Thank you. have a wonderful. If you haven't read it, it's so yeah. good. Everyone have a wonderful evening, wonderful day, depending on where you are in the world. And thanks again so much. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye, everybody. Thank you.